Good morning, listener. Or afternoon. Good morning, Chris. Or afternoon, David. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose. Um, well, it's morning for us. Um, almost. It's not. Good afternoon, listeners. There we go. I'm David Robertson. And I'm Chris Carter, and we are the Religious Studies Project, or part of it, I suppose. Five years ago, we could have said we are. But, yes, uh, yeah, we're, we're not. not. No, we're just... We're, we're your hosts, your friendly neighbourhood people indeed. again. Your yeah. hosts. Um, as you correctly point out, the Religious Studies Project is far more than just us, and, uh, you know, Thomas White, he's one of them. He is one of them. And this, one of those guys. One of those interviewers that we have. Yeah. And uh, he recorded this interview with Marion Maddox at the EASR, I believe. Yes, indeed. Religion, Education and Politics in Australia and New Zealand. Take it away, Tom. Well, it is a beautiful morning here on the penultimate day of the EASR in Bern. And I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Marion Maddox of Macquarie University in Sydney. Marion is a professor of politics at Macquarie and she has PhDs in theology from Flinders and another PhD in philosophy from the University of New South Wales. It is probably no exaggeration to say that Professor Maddox is the leading authority on questions of religion and politics in Australia and it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us in the recording studio this morning. Um, Professor Maddox, welcome. Thank you, it's lovely to be here. Uh, And... um, yeah, so your paper was delivered on Monday. Today's Wednesday, so it's a couple of days down the line. But uh, I thought perhaps before going into the paper, um, as a first question to ease mm-hmm. into the interview, could you please tell us a little bit about how you um, became a, pr- a professor of uh, you know religion and politics in Australia? Yeah, well, um, sort of by mistake. Uh, I Let's see, I did a PhD in theology, And by the time I'd finished, I was very sure that I didn't want to work for the church, which is pretty much the only thing you can really do with a PhD in theology in the normal kind of career progression in Australia. And so I applied for jobs all around the place, and the one that I happened to get, which was not sort of what I imagined myself doing, but you know how it is when you finish your PhD and you apply all around the place, and... Uh, you get what you happen to get. The one that I happened to get was in a fabulous department which no longer exists at the University of South Australia and um, what we did was provide teacher training to teachers of religious studies because in those days South Australia had thought that it was going to have a non-confessional RE program for teachers in public schools and they had set up this whole department to train the teachers for it. But what actually happened was that that program was never implemented and they instead, we provided teacher training for Catholic school mainly. Our main clientele was Catholic school deputy principals who had to get a degree in religious education in order to get the next step on their promotion. And so we were kind of a a, um, service provider for the Catholic Education Office and then ACU, the Australian Catholic University, got set up and we lost that uh, client base and the department isn't there anymore. Um, But it was a a fantastic department and I learnt there what non-confessional education about religions is because we were providing it to all these Catholic school teachers who were, uh, like you'd see them come in thinking that religious education is catechesis and then they'd go through this program and discover that actually there's a whole other way of thinking about uh, religion. And I worked there for five years. I was on a uh, contract and when my contract ran out, then I cast around and um, applied for jobs and the one that I happened to get, again, was in Australian politics at uh, the University of Adelaide. Mm-hmm. And while I was doing that, I thought, hang on a minute, there's all this work on religion and politics in America, but nobody's doing anything on religion and politics in Australia. And But there's a huge story here. And um, while I was doing that uh, two-year contract in politics at the University of Adelaide, a big story was in the paper every single day 
on and on and on. In fact, it started while I was at in, in religious studies at the University of South Australia, and that was the Hindmarsh Island Royal Commission, which anybody who lives in South Australia will still know what that is straight away. It was on the front page of the Ad- Adelaide Advertiser for a couple of years, mm-hmm. which was an inquiry into whether a group of Aboriginal women from South Australia had fabricated so-called secret women's business, which is now a phrase in Australian vernacular, but it wasn't until then, which was a set of traditional beliefs that because they were secret, they hadn't talked about before. Mm -hmm. So white Australia went, we've never heard of this, you must have made it up. But the point of it was that these beliefs were about a tract of water between Hindmarsh Island and the mainland and its sacredness, these women said, should prevent a marina being built that was wanting to be built by some developers. And so this whole question of should sacred sites stand in the way of development blew up into a question about do Aboriginal people make up traditions in order to stop development and um, are they being manipulated by greenies? Mm -hmm. And there was a series of inquiries. And so this question about how does non-Aboriginal Australia deal with questions of sacredness seemed to me to be a very sort of religion and politics question that uh, mainstream Australia didn't have a vocabulary to deal with. So Mm -hmm. I wrote quite a lot about that. Um, and then when the University of Adelaide contract ran out, see, my, my academic trajectory has been, uh, really shaped by the conditions of the labour market. I then applied for and got the Australian Parliamentary Fellowship, which is a fantastic program run by the Parliamentary Library, which still exists, but in a different and I think not as good form. But in those days, it was a one year program where you worked in Parliament as a research fellow for a year. And you spend half your time doing an independent individual research project and the other half the time supplying um, information for members and senators mm-hmm. on anything they asked about. And my independent research project was about religion and Australian parliamentary processes. And I wrote my first book, which was called For God and Country, Religious Dynamics in Australian Federal Politics, which was the only Parliamentary Fellows monograph ever to sell out (laughs) and go to a second printing. And it's now available free online as a PDF download. And um, then after that, I got uh, my first permanent job, yes, at Victoria University, Wellington in New Zealand. And there we had a course on religion and politics. So. Yeah, long answer to Oh, okay. Well, this segues nicely with a, a question I was going to ask towards the end. But the situation of uh, politics and religion in Australia and the situation of politics and religion in New Zealand, was it quite a, a shift going to Victoria after, you know, developing all your exp- expertise on the situation in Australia? It really was. I was quite sort of... Like, I had set foot in New Zealand once before, like I did the interview for the job over the phone, so I had only been there once years earlier for a conference, so I didn't know anything about New Zealand except I'd heard this rumour they had really good coffee, which proved to be true. Excellent coffee, yes. Yep, yep, and that was such a wrench coming back. Um, But uh, so when I got to Wellington, I... Um, I remember going to my first uh, faculty meeting and thinking, I'm going to have to get a dictionary because there was so much Maori language that Mm. is just sort of used as a matter of course in everyday discourse, like from university management and in university processes and... I don't know what all these words meant. Like someone, a student, if a student has a problem, they're allowed to bring their whanau support I don't know, I learned, but uh, it was a very sharp learning curve and that was required a whole sort of cultural shift. Mm-hmm. And um, and then when I moved back to Australia, it was a culture shock again to have that Indigenous perspective suddenly not present in mm-hmm. Australian university processes. So that was one thing that I noticed. Um, and the political system, when we moved to New Zealand, New Zealand had only quite recently made the shift to MMP, um, multi-member proportional voting, 
whereas Australia uses single transferable vote in the lower house and a version of proportional representation in the upper house. And so I learnt that the voting system has quite a strong effect, which I hadn't really, like I'd intellectually known, but I hadn't kind of seen it in action and so I hadn't kind of viscerally appreciated the effect that it has on things like the ways that religious interests can um, have an effect in electoral politics. And while we were in New Zealand, that there was the dramatic election when a religiously influenced party in New Zealand first got a... Um, uh, sorry, United Future New Zealand got an unexpectedly big um, uh, vote and effectively the balance of power in uh, the New Zealand Parliament. So, yeah, I, I learned a lot of things and um, I and I did have to go on a, a sharp learning curve mm. and I couldn't kind of I, I couldn't be an expert on New Zealand politics straight away. I had to kind of make a, a quick uh, catch up. Oh, that, that's interesting. So, is uh, trying to rephrase that in a very broad brush and perhaps some <laughs> overly clumsy would uh, positioning would it be the implication that because New Zealand is a bit more open to you know ethnic difference and mm-hmm. kind of more well um, you know, married and got much mm-hmm. stronger representation within the political system, this is carried over into a more access for religion within the public space or more representation of religion in the public space in New Zealand than in Australia? Well, I'd say it's a different kind of presence. Australia has the a history of a strongly articulated policy of multiculturalism, uh, which has been under sort of increasing attack over recent decade or two, uh, but multiculturalism became official policy in 1974 and at least in for a long time there was a quite a strong infrastructure of policy and practice to support that, uh, whereas New Zealand's policy is biculturalism. Mm-hmm. So there are, that has kind of made different spaces for religious communities to be present in public space. Um, New Zealand is further down the secularisation path than Australia is if we think of secularisation as meaning the religious practice of the majority of the population. So in the last Australian census, 54% of Australians claimed to be of some sort of have some sort of religious mm. adherence. I'm not sure what the figure is for New Zealand, but New Zealand got to that 50, just over 50 percent, a couple of censuses ago. So I imagine it's lower now. But the the striking difference about religion in public space that I noticed when I lived in New Zealand is um, in, in New Zealand, Maori make up not only a bigger proportion of the population, but also a much more cohesive proportion of the population mm-hmm. than Aboriginal people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people do in Australia. So Indigenous Australians are about 2 to 3% of the population, whereas Maori at the time that I was living there were, I think, about 15%. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, and the other big difference is that Maori have a common language, whereas Aboriginal Australians and um, Torres Strait Islanders are uh, many different language groups. There were about 500 language groups at the time of European contact. So, for example, when I enrolled my daughter at primary school in Wellington, uh, she, on her first day when she was five, we went along to Newtown Primary and there was a ceremony to welcome the new students and it was 45 minutes long and every last word of it was in Māori mm-hmm. and all the little Pākehā kids like my daughter just had to sit there and sit there politely and listen. And the principal made a quite long speech, I guess about 15 minutes long, and every now and then a smattering of people in the audience laughed mm-hmm. and the rest of us knew that he'd made a joke and <laughs> uh, and there was a haka. And uh, my daughter had never seen a haka before, having come from recently from Australia. Yes. So she was just kind of gobsmacked. Then once she started at school, every day started with karakia, which is a Maori prayers for the beginning of something important. And um, it was in Maori. And most of well, the, the children who didn't speak Māori didn't know what the content of the karakia was. They just mm-hmm. knew that this was something important that they had to 
sort of pay respectful attention to. And then one day we were sitting in a church service and the vicar said, we will now chant the Lord's Prayer in Māori. And my daughter said in a triumphant stage whisper, I know this. <laughs> and only at that point did she realise that what she'd been saying every day mm-hmm. in so at school was actually Christian content but delivered in Māori language. So there, there is a lot more kind of theological presence in New Zealand public life through the Māori traditions than there is in Australia, partly because of the treaty obligation to respect Māori tradition, much of which has a Christian content. So that was a sort of um, eye-opener to me about the pre- the way, the, the many ways that mm. religious meaning can be present in public life. Yeah, get, get carried in on the, the, yeah. the representation of the mm. Māori voices. Mm. Oh, excellent. Yeah, that's uh, an interesting kind of contrast mm. taking place mm. there. Sorry to interrupt the episode, but we just wanted to let you know to remind you about our Patreon link. Uh, The Religious Studies Project has always been free since its inception, um, but we know that there's a great problem in academia with uh, people not being paid for the work that they're expected to do, particularly early career scholars. And we at the RSP want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. So you can help if you can spare even one pound a month um, by going to patreon.com slash Project RS and subscribing. We know that these podcasts are very useful for people who are teaching and people in their learning. So if you can help um, either by subscribing there or by making a one-off donation using the PayPal button on our website, it'd be greatly appreciated and will help us keep bringing this podcast for free and fight against exploitation in academia. But now, back to the episode. So throughout your career, very much kind of looking at public policy. You mentioned in your paper that uh, you uh, take great value from Bucky's approach to the analysis of public yeah. policy in terms yeah. of um, framing the problem. Could you perhaps explain to our listeners what that's about? Yeah, well, Carol Bucky was actually my colleague at the University of Adelaide, and um, she developed this uh, approach called What's the Problem Represented to Be, which is a problem framing analysis uh, technique that she has very successfully disseminated, particularly to Australian public policy practitioners and people working on the boundaries of academia and public service. And so it's taking off from the observation that anyone working in policy framing is aware of, which is that how you frame the question uh, has a big influence on uh, how you find the solution. So if the problem is traffic congestion, uh, you, if you think the problem is not enough roads, then you build more roads, but then you still end up because all that happens is everybody takes their cars out and you end up with still more blocked roads. So uh, is the problem to traf- solution to traffic congestion actually not enough roads or is it, you know, having to think about traffic a different way? Um, but so she developed this sort of uh, six-point uh, technique uh, based on a um, Foucauldian uh, set of s- assumptions where you ask what is the problem in any particular policy framework, what is the problem represented to be, why is the problem represented to be this way, what assumptions underlie this problem representation, how could it be represented differently and whose interests are being served by representing it in this way rather than some other way. And if we represent it some in a different, you know, what different problem representations could we come up with and who would benefit or lose by representing it in different ways and what uh, consequences would flow from different problem representations. And um, so I was applying that approach to looking at the way that the quest- questions about secular education mm-hmm. have been uh, framed and applied in 19th and 21st century Australia and France. Yeah, so the, I really enjoyed the paper and I think Thank it got you. a good response from the audience. So the, the comparative analysis of trajectories of religion in schools in France and Australia, um, I think probably for most of our listeners they'll be more familiar with the front France kind of situation because the mm. veil and you know has mm. received a lot of the popular attention. So, 
Starting with Australia, you know, mm. what's the story regarding religion in schools in Australia? How has that developed? Well, Australia, um, the the story about educa- Australian education goes back before Australia was a country when it was a set of uh, colonies that the, the Australian colonies federated in 1901 and at the time everybody thought New Zealand was going to join in as well but it didn't. Um, and the uh, each of the colonies started out with their schools being mainly provided by churches because that was who had the resources to do it. And then as they got they, – they were sort of scrambling to set up local infrastructure and uh, they gradually – they were governed directly from the UK and then they established local parliaments and then the parliaments uh, set up school systems. And so there's a very good record in the uh, local Hansards, the records of parliamentary debates, about uh, – of the parliamentarians debating what kind of school system they should set up. And they all, each of the um, parliaments in turn, debated should religion be taught in the public schools and should the parliaments be subsidised or the governments be subsidising religious schools alongside the public system. And each of them decided for very similar reasons, the same debates were had in parliament after parliament, no, they should not be subsidising religious schools Mm -hmm. and they should not have religion taught in the public schools for the for and both of those things for the same reason namely that children should be going to the or should be encouraged to go to the public schools because they wanted to overcome the problem that they had uh, perceived uh, which was sectarianism that was dividing the, poten- the biggest potential division in their communities was sectarianism. And uh, so divisions between Catholic and Protestant students, was, that was the main division, but other divisions like uh, between, uh, particularly in South Australia, they talked a lot about, um, they imagined a future uh, colony where there might be Jewish and Muslim mm-hmm. students as well, and uh, maybe Buddhist. They mentioned in the 19th century parliaments they thought the best way was for all of those students to be educated side by side and to grow into one cohesive community. And they thought that any attempt, uh, like they, they wondered, could there be some kind of non denominational Christianity or could there be some sort of, no, that won't work because that'll still exclude the little Jews and Muslim the Buddhists. Mm-hmm. Uh, can we teach some sort of uh, general religion that doesn't offend anybody? And then they, they sort of flirted with that idea for about five minutes and realized that uh, that isn't going to f- work. It will go to offend somebody. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yep. And in the end, they concluded the only way is just not to have religion in the public schools. Mm-hmm. All the people in the debates were very religious people, by and large, or you know, fairly religious people. They they were not anti-religion. They, in fact, uh, some of them were very devout, and they made speeches along the lines of religion is just too important to let it be politicised by mm-hmm. having it um, kicked around in the education debates. We need to protect religion by keeping it out of the public schools and churches. Also, um, some of them wanted to have the Bible in schools, but some of them, like the Congregationalists in South Australia, they passed a series of motions through their synod saying the Bible should be kept out of public schools to protect it from being turned into a fetish or being turned into a political football. Mm-hmm. So um, there was a quite a um, sort of unified, surprisingly to me, unified view among uh, across the religious and non-religious spectrum, but the non-religious spectrum in 19th century Australia was very minute, uh, that... Um, Religion didn't belong in public education. Mm. Uh, and we're still talking here kind of religious instruction or yep. or kind of a values-based religion-type education yeah. as opposed to the more kind of RE that you might get in more contemporary schooling systems, which is just exploring descriptive aspects of religion. Yeah, well, the, um, the exception was New South Wales. Mm-hmm. And because New South Wales is so big, 
a lot of the debate that we have now sort of takes the New South Wales experience as normative, but actually New South Wales was really the exception. Mm -hmm. And what New South Wales did, it was the last state to pass, it, or colony to pass its uh, Secular Education Act in 1880, and it was also the most equivocal because the sectarian issue was the fiercest in New South Wales. But it kept something called general religious education mm -hmm. in its um, uh, Education Act, and that was where teachers could give general religious information, mm -hmm. which the 19th century legislators thought was going to be a kind of non-denominational Christian RE, not education about religion in the way we think of it now was going to be sort of Bible instruction but without dog dogmatic commentary. Uh, and New South Wales also kept in a, a capacity for ministers of religion to come in for up to an hour a day, although oh, no. nobody actually did that, to instruct members of their own denomination, give in-house catechetical yes, yes. instruction. The more kind of education about religions as a educa as an educational subject by and large is still not taught in Australian schools there's a little element in the civics mm -hmm. um, okay. curriculum in the national curriculum but I think it would be true to say that most Australian students wouldn't notice that they've received it uh, it's a, a bit about uh, you know the, religions of your neighbours kind of thing. Um, and in New South Wales, there's also studies of religion in the last two years of high school that you can take as an optional subject. Nearly everybody that takes it takes it from private schools, religious schools, um, but it's a very good pro program in that it is seriously a um, non-confessional mm -hmm. RE and you can't do it in just one tradition you have to do uh, like you can't like if you're a Catholic school most of the Catholic schools make Christianity one of their traditions but you have to do another one as is well. That, is that an initiative coming out of the, the Catholic Church itself or is this a kind of a, a regulation from the, the national education body? No it's so uh, it's um, overseen by the Board of Studies which is the um, New South Wales Board oh, okay. of yes. Education. And although it's uh, the majority of students who take it are in private schools, mm -hmm. uh, also some public schools offer it as well. And some students take it as a, um, um independent study unit. Okay. But, uh, as your paper was suggesting, there's a, there's a wind of change blowing through the, Australian education system, or ever since John Howard anyway, things are um, perhaps moving in a slightly different direction. Is that correct? There are currents of change pulling in different directions. Mm -hmm. So um, actually even going back before John Howard, there have been there has been a, a move of increasing segregation in Australian education. So uh, Gough Whitlam, actually the, the hero of progressive politics, he in 1973 introduced a huge change to bring back public funding of private schools. He also greatly increased school funding across the board. So there was just so much largesse going around for uh, schools that it d didn't create a great deal of protest. And also he directed it, targeted it towards the most needy, mm -hmm. um, poor Catholic schools. Uh, but every reiteration of the funding arrangement since then has been to the benefit of wealthier schools and to the detriment of the public school system. So we now have a very segmented school system where large numbers of wealthy schools are funded over their official allocation because they've managed to do special deals where mm -hmm. they get funding for their running costs and then on top of that for building programs and for additional special projects. And the funding allocation to public schools has gone down uh, proportionally 
And it's the private schools that are more often the religious private, uh, run schools or the. Uh, over 90% of private schools in Australia are attached to Christian denominations mm-hmm. one way or another. Whereas public schools are officially secular, although um, the other change that is a Howard change is that public schools also have uh, increasing amounts of religious presence in them, for example, through the National School Chaplaincy Program, which is a government-funded program that Mm -hmm. puts almost exclusively Christian chaplains in public schools. Um, And uh, and another Howard change is that the kind, the makeup of the private school market has changed with a um, easing the regulations for small private schools, most of which tend to be from the more conservative evangelical mm-hmm. end of the spectrum. It, it, are, are these yeah. changes actually done with a religious or kind of a, a motive of actually? helping religions gain a larger foothold in education or is this actually due to kind of changing educational policies in relation to the the freedom of institutions mm-hmm. to develop their own curricula or have more autonomy from national or um, state education bodies? I think um, it's uh, from looking at Howard's statements of why he was making those changes, I would say that it's a combination of things. The Liberal Party, which was his government, was a Liberal government, their general preference is for private providers rather than public provision, Mm -hmm. not uh, on the basis of any educational uh, evidence, but that's just they oversaw outsourcing of public services in a whole range of areas and education is one. I do, however, think he had a deliberate strategy of courting the conservative Christian end of uh, uh, the conservative Christian demographic because before he came to power in 1996, he had identified progressive churches as one of a series of groups, including feminists, academics, um, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation environmentalist. He had this list of people. The usual and, troublemakers. And, yes, that's yes. right. Um, who had blocked reforms that his previous predecessors in the Liberal Party had tried to implement. And, um, liberal Christians were one of, one of his targeted groups. And so when he, uh, got in, in 1996, he embarked on a program of telling progressive churches to get in, back in their box and stick to talking about spiritual matters. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, he, um, uh, went out of his way to, uh, go to Hillsong church conventions, um, to, uh, um, do this thing of, um, uh, easing the regulations for small Christian schools to uh, make a series of statements on uh, sort of conservative so-called family values issues mm-hmm. and complain about political correctness and generally sort of court that more um, so-called Christian values, conservative values um, end of the religious spectrum, that which is only actually a very tiny proportion of the population in Australia. Australia doesn't have a big kind of... U.S. Christian right market, but he was talking that sort of language. It was at the same time that uh, George Bush was um, aligning himself with the U.S. Christian right and Mm -hmm. Howard was echoing in a more muted way that same sort of language and appealing in Australia not to an actual existent evangelical voter base but more to a a group of uh, a, a part of the population that doesn't go to church but thinks that values are a good idea yes. and uh, Christians uh, seem to have them and um, uh, maybe, you know, society's falling apart and we'd better stick to the person who seems to know uh, w- what values are and where they're to be found. Okay. Well, th- well this uh, leads nicely on to the issue of securitization and the mm. securitization of education um, and the way that perhaps in this instance religion or uh, conservative Christian organizations are being seen as a resource through which that can be accomplished. Um, 
Could you tell us a bit about that, how that might be taking place in Australian schools? Yes. So when we talk about securitisation, I guess the big thing everybody thinks of is 9-11. Mm-hmm. But in Australia, that story had actually started before 9-11 because Australia is, has this illegal immigrant panic, which or so-called illegal immigrant is actually legitimate asylum seekers yeah. uh, who are almost all found to be genuine refugees. But the... Um, Liberal government had started using the term illegals about such people from the late 1990s and there was already this campaign underway to portray them as not just culturally other and a threat to Australia's borders but also as religiously other by pointing out that the people arriving in boats on our borders were at the time mainly Muslim and so kind of religious othering and fear-mongering about asylum seekers, portraying them as a threat to Australia's national security, was already well underway before 9-11 mm-hmm. happened. And so 9-11 only uh, escalated a process that was already well underway from the late 1990s in Australia. And the things that were happening in Australian education about... Um, messaging, government messaging about excessive political correctness and erosion of the Judeo-Christian ethic, whatever that may be, and um, loss of quote-unquote values um, had, had set the stage very effectively for this national security reorientation of uh, the story about uh, needing to turn classrooms into a place where we look out for children who are at risk of radicalisation. Mm -hmm. So Australia has not actually had a terrorist attack on the scale of the uh, Charlie Hebdo assassinations or anything Mm -hmm. like that. There have been a couple of Australian teenagers who've gone tried to go overseas and been intercepted at the airport and some who actually have gone overseas and fought with ISIS. So to summarise, if, if I may, Professor Maddox, where the Australian education system started out with a strong commitment to keeping religion out of its education system in the name of openness and inclusivity, under the Howard government, religion and specifically Christian values are making a, um, a quiet return as an educational resource, largely to push against a liberal politics in Australia. <laughs> and indeed, perhaps, therefore, confirming some of those earlier reservations uh, in the 19th century about religion and education becoming a political tool. Uh, this has been a fascinating, fascinating topic. Professor Maddox, thank you very much for your time and your expertise. Thank you to our listeners. Farewell from Bern. Brilliant to be able to bring you uh, that interview that Tom recorded. Um, It's the first um, of his interviews from Bern, and we will be getting his second before our festive break. So I'm looking forward to that one as well. And great to get a perspective on education. We've had Canada, we've had the UK, and now we've had Australia and New Zealand. Um, Pity, I suppose, that uh, all English-speaking nations and such. So if you're out there and you're a specialist in... um, religion and education in, in, in a context that we haven't covered. Get in touch. Indeed. Um, it wasn't a deliberate uh, theme, which is kind of has happened, but isn't it interesting that all of these scholars in different parts of the Anglophone world, at least, are, are taking education so uh, seriously? Indeed. And we did um, back um, one of our very early podcasts, I believe, was uh, on the broader sort of non-geospecific topic of religion and education that Jonathan Tuckett did with Tim Jensen. So there is a a non-Anglophone context because he was primarily looking at his um, home turf of Denmark in that, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. It just seems to have come to the surface as uh, an important topic in in what we're doing um, over the last year or so. So that's interesting in itself, a little bit of meta-discursive analysis. It is indeed. So next week, we have a a treat for you, another important topic. It's an interview with Katayun Kishi on um, 
a global study of government restrictions and social hostilities relating to religion, drawing on large international data sets, um, I think from the Pew Research Center. Um, so we're really glad to be bringing you that. That interview has been conducted by Benjamin Marcus, and um, I believe we're going to hear an introduction from Ben right now. Hello, my name is Ben Marcus, and I have the privilege of serving as the Religious Literacy Specialist with the Religious Freedom Center of the Freedom Forum Institute in Washington, D.C. The Religious Freedom Center is a nonpartisan, nonsectarian organization that leads domestic and international education programs on the intersection of religion and public life for educators, religious and civic leaders, and private employers. At the RFC, I lead our education track. It's my job to provide training and curricular resources for primary and secondary school educators who are interested in teaching about religion in academically rigorous and constitutionally appropriate ways. My research and writing examines the intersection of education, religious literacy, and identity formation in the United States. I have developed religious literacy programs for public schools, universities, U.S. government organizations, businesses, and private foundations in the U.S. and abroad. For example, in February 2018, I received a Fulbright Specialist Grant through which I was able to work with the Albanian Ministry of Education to develop a national manual for teaching about religion while respecting the rights of students of all religions and none. Back in 2016-2017, I chaired the writing group for the Religious Studies Companion Document to the C3 Framework, a nationally recognized set of guidelines used by state and school district curriculum experts in the United States. As far as academic credentials go, I earned a Master's of Theological Studies as a Presidential Scholar at Harvard Divinity School. As an undergrad, I studied religion at the University of Cambridge and Brown University. I'm very excited to be part of the Religious Studies Project, and I look forward to introducing you all to scholars that focus on religious literacy education and the religious landscape of the United States. So to hear Ben's first interview, uh, join us next week when he'll be speaking to Katayun Kishi. Um, other than that... Yeah, we're just um, you know, sorry that we weren't at the AAR again. David and I have yet to, to make it to one. Um, the, the conference always comes across as disturbingly big. I described it on Twitter as like a German Christmas market, um, as in not something I particularly relish the thought of going to. <laughs> it starts too early and attracts uh, too many people at the same place. Yeah, something like that. Um, well, I'm sure we will make it along sometime. We've had... Um, um, Rebecca Barrett Fox was there. She's our um, one of our features co-editors, and Candice Mixon uh, recorded a podcast for us there. And I know lots of other RSP friends were there as well. So we hope you had a great time. Yeah, we'll be hearing from uh, AAR very soon. Well, not I say very soon. We're recorded right up, I think, into the middle of next spring. So um, you'll be hearing from AAR at some point. But it's a good uh, opportunity to thank all of our editors for the amazing work they're doing this year and uh, all of the content we're bringing you. And don't forget that includes bonus content such as the Discourse Show, a monthly news uh, roundup hosted by um, us, uh, other RSP editors and guests. Um, and also, uh, Are You My Data, of which there's a, a new one Um just released with Russell McCutcheon um, and you can if you sign up for Patreon only you know as little as one dollar a month you can get access to all of these extra shows but uh, you know whether you're a Patreon or whether you're listening to the free feed thanks for listening the Religious Studies Project is sponsored by the British Association for the Study of Religions, the North American Association for the Study of Religion, and the International Association for the History of Religions. The RSP is produced by the Religious Studies Project Association, SCIO, a Scottish charitable incorporated organisation, charity number SCO 47750. Brought to you by founders and editors-in-chief Chris Cotter and David Robertson, and our managing editor Thomas J. Coleman III. Our features are edited by Jonathan Tuckett and our opportunities digest by Ella Bock. Podcast transcription by Helen Bradstock with audio editing by Gregory Schneider and Samuel Ward. Social media managed by Ray Radford and sales and marketing by Sammy Bishop. 
And don't forget, you can support the project by using our Amazon.com.co.uk and .ca links, or donating at Patreon.com slash Project RS. And you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, YouTube, iTunes, and other portals. 